Hi everyone, um, so here is the second neonate in a nutshell little chat that we're doing with the ANMP team. Um, I am Amy and I've also got Emily here with me today. Hiya. Um, so we're going to be going through pulmonary hemorrhage this week. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the um, abdominal x-ray one from last week and found it useful. Um, but yes, so this is what we're covering today, uh, pulmonary hemorrhage. So let's get stuck in. Uh, first one, what is pulmonary hemorrhage? Um, so Obviously, for lots of you who will have already seen this, but with pulmonary hemorrhage, um, it's just when you have um, grossly bloody secretions which are coming up the ET tube. Um, so by definition, really, it's, it's sort of a, a complication of babies that are ventilated. Um, the incidence does vary. Um, it can be from 0.8 to 50 babies per every thousand babies that we have. Um, unfortunately, though, it only has a 50% survival rate. So of those babies, it is a very serious complication in neonatal care. Um, of those 50% that survive, um, lots of them will require longer ventilation and they can end up with lots of long-term complications. So the most significant ones are chronic lung disease and then they can also be at increased risk of things like cerebral palsy um, and seizures. So it's a nasty thing. Um, what causes pulmonary hemorrhage? So mostly it's actually secondary to when babies are overloaded and they've got pulmonary edema. Um, so you don't tend to get these true bleeds, which is what people tend to think. So um, yeah, so it's one of the reasons we need to be really careful not to overload babies. Um, and it's usually caused if you have like a rapid drop in intrapulmonary pressure. So if you get left to right shunting. So again, babies that have PDA can be affected by this um, because you've got increased blood flow going to the lungs, which shouldn't be there. Um, but essentially, it's, it's actually quite multifactorial. So babies that have lots of different risk factors are more likely to have it. And it's sort of, yeah, so it accumulates. So um, here are the risk factors. So there's loads of them. We'll just work our way through bit by bit. Um, yes, yeah, so any baby who is low birth weight or preterm or IUGR, so they're essentially just very little and very fragile, um, are much more likely to be at risk. Um, multiple births, um, and it is something that happens within the first week on the whole. So, um, yeah, just something to be aware of when you're looking after these babies, it's going to happen earlier on. Um, it can also happen in term babies. It tends to be babies that have had low APGARs, and it's just sort of, you know, an indication really that... Um, something's happened at delivery they've been compromised um, and you've obviously thinking about things like you know they're going to have hypoxia which is the next one on the list um, so they, this baby sort of had some sort of insult so there's sort of variations going on as we mentioned before it's pretty much sort of babies that are ventilated um, so they have underlying respiratory problems such as RDS or meconium aspiration syndrome um, there's also the, this issue of the fact that if there's too much blood around so you've got um, overloading of the lungs so that might be if babies have had blood transfusions and so they just get wet lungs um, if they've got PDAs also further down we've got left-sided heart failure um, one thing to think about is if you give babies surfactant that can also increase their risk because you're going to have pockets of the lung which might still be very stiff um, if they've had RDS um, and then you've got areas where they're very elastic so it's just this variation again um, something to think about, oh sorry, in the last bit on this list about the babies is about um, if they've got any clotting issues. Um, we've, I've put DIC there as sort of like further down, but if you've got any baby who's got any problems with clotting, they're more likely to have uncontrolled bleeding. Um, so yes, yeah, other things to think about though is if you've got any maternal factors. So um, the most likely is if we've got mums who've had infections, um, but also things like if they've had PET, um, cocaine use is, effect, uh, is um, associated with shifts in um, blood flow. So, yeah, all of those things. And um, if you have any babies who are breached, just because it's extra sort of pressure on them. Um, so, yeah, so now I've got a little activity for you guys to do at home. Um, if you want to just grab a piece of paper um, and spend a couple of minutes just writing out a list... Um, of any signs, if you have a baby, what would you expect to see if you thought that somebody had, uh, if a baby had a pulmonary hemorrhage? Um, so if you just want to pause it here and do that, and then we will come and we will talk about what they are. Okay, so hopefully you've got most of these. Um, the most obvious one is the fact if you see blood in the ET tube, specifically kind of frank blood, there will be lots of it. Um, the baby will have a, some sort of sudden deterioration. So if you've had a nice stable baby on a ventilator and then they've suddenly deteriorated, you'll be doing all your checks, the sort of DOPE 
um, checklist. Um, but so this is one of the ones to think about. Um, hypoxia, so you've got a baby who's got an increasing oxygen requirement, you just can't seem to get on top of it. The baby might appear very pale um, because they're having the uncontrolled blood loss um, and if this is severe then they can look like they're in shock. Um, we've already mentioned about this deterioration, so you would see apneas and bradys and the baby would appear cyanosed. Okay, so second activity is, so you've got this, you're, you're assuming that it could be pulmonary hemorrhage, what are you going to do? So just um, a couple of minutes, just scribble down um, what you're going to do if you're suspecting that this could be happening. Okay, and here are the answers. So yeah, see how many of these you've got. Um, as we mentioned before, it's a really serious thing that happens, a 50% mortality rate, so you want to call for help nice and early. Um, it's important to think that you are going to use an ABC approach anyway. Whenever you've got an unstable baby, just make sure, you know, is the airway patent moving on to breathing and circulation. Um, but yes, so it's this is sort of an airway issue. Um, so the first thing to do is if they're on the ventilator, you're going to increase the PEEP. Um, and the reason for that is a bit like if you have a, a severe bleed, like on your arm or something, you're going to apply pressure to stop that bleeding. It's a way of applying pressure inside the lung. So just by pushing that extra air in, it's hopefully going to sort of slow any uncontrolled blood loss. Um, increase the oxygen just to make sure that the areas of the lungs that haven't been affected can still sort of get oxygen to the baby. Um, and the most important thing is to suction and suction frequently um, and keep an idea of exactly how much losses there are because we'll be replacing those. Um, so yeah, so it's really important to just try and keep that ET patent if you can, so just keep suctioning. Um, I've got here, don't change the ET if, all poss if possible, um, just because as soon as that ET tube comes out and you're trying to put a new one in, it's really difficult to get a good view and obviously there's just all this blood coming so you're having to do the ongoing suctioning, so if at all possible, leave it in. Um, it's worth thinking that some babies might need high frequency um, to increase the PEEP further. Um, and then the other thing to be doing is just, as I said before, we're going to be replacing any losses with packed red cells. Um, and also we'd be sending bloods at this point. So checking out things like clotting factors because the baby will probably need extra things like platelets or FFP in time. Um, and it's worth considering how does the baby had vitamin K and if they have, do they need an extra dose? OK, so that's pretty much all of the theory. So just last of all, I'm going to hand over to Emily and we're going to go through a case study. So we're going to try and put everything together um, by looking at this case study and mainly looking at the risk factors and then the signs and obviously thinking about treatment options. So we have got a 26 plus three week um, gestation baby boy. He's day two of life. Um, spontaneous preterm delivery after mum was unwell for one week with DMV. He was a quick delivery and had mum had one lot of steroids before delivery. Um, at delivery, baby received inflation breaths and then the baby was transferred to the neonate unit on mobile vapor firm. Um, within the first six hours, they had increased oxygen requirement and increased work of breathing, so they required surfactant via Lisa. And then um, at 12 hours of age, they had increased apneas and bradys, so the baby was intubated and ventilated. The x-ray at the time showed RDS. And um, during this time, they also had an unstable blood pressure on day one and were given a bolus of normal saline and commenced on dopamine, dopamine via the UVC. They then had this sudden deterioration and blood was noted in the ET tube on day two of life. Okay, so looking at that case study, Emily, what are the things that are sort of like jumping out at you as risk factors here? Um, so obviously the baby's preterm and it doesn't help that he is a boy as they tend to do a little bit worse. Um, he's also within his first week of life. So he's on day two and um, this was a bit more of a risk if I seem to remember. Um, then mum only had one lot of steroids. So this can also be a, be a bit of a risk factor. And um, there have been some apneas and bradys, so the baby might have had a bit of hypoxic um, event during this, and then that's also a bit of a risk to a pulmonary hemorrhage. And the, also the fact that they did actually have surfactant, um, and that was on the list of perhaps there's then pockets of um, lung which aren't getting the surfactant, and then you still have that kind of stiff lung in areas. Yeah. Any of us? 
Um, yeah, I think that's probably it, isn't it? Okay, so and then so that's the risk factors. Yep. And then what are the signs that might make you think that this baby was having a pulmonary hemorrhage? Okay, so obviously there was the blood that was noted in the T tube. Um, then also the fact that the baby had had apneas and bradycardias. Uh, they had a deterioration. And also the fact of that their blood pressure was unstable, so it might be that there is kind of the, that difference um, which might lead to a pulmonary hemorrhage. Cool. Okay. So, um, and then finally, um, based on what we've talked about already, what sort of treatment things do you think that this baby would need? Um, so first off, I would obviously get help. And then think about suctioning, especially if I can see the blood in the ET tube and trying to keep that ET tube patent. Mm -hmm. uh, then start thinking about extra things, so such as if the baby is on the ventilator or if they need a new ET tube, um, obviously trying to keep it in. Uh, increasing the ventilation, the PEEP. Yep. And oxygen, increasing the oxygen. Um, and considering kind of your ABC approach. Yeah. So whether you've got a patent airway, so whether the T tube, yeah, knee suction in, um, whether it is actually in, and then going on through your ventilation and then thinking about circulation, so such as replacement of fluids or blood. Yeah, and sending off the bloods and everything. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so um, I think that is it. So hopefully you guys have found that useful. Um, so the take-home message really um, is just to be aware of those risk factors. So um, I've got here, so you know, if you've got any preterm or IUGR baby, um, if they're ventilated, if they've got underlying respiratory problems such as RDS, especially if they've got any unstable blood um, flow issues as well, like if they have a PDA, um, and if they've had surfactant, so extra things being given to them to increase their risk, just be really aware of that so that um, if anything does happen, you can get treatment done nice and quickly. Okay, so um, I've got any questions here. So if there is anything that's come up here that you're not quite sure about or if you wanted to know some extra information, please feel free to email either myself or Emily um, or any of the ANMP team or catch us on the ward. Uh, very happy to chat. Um, the other thing we'd like to say is that obviously we're going to try and do these nice and f as frequently as we can. So if there's any other issues that you'd like us to cover or if there's any specific topics which would be useful, um, let us know and we will do our best to help. Thank you very much. Thank you.